40 board meeting to order. At this time, I would uh, like to call on board member Flores to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you all please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. The first item on our agenda is that of public comment, and I have cards from two individuals. May I first invite Supervisor John Pedroza forward. Good morning. John Pedroza, Merced, California. Um, I just again wanted to come up here today and thank you for uh, approving the application last week for to consider the whole valley and then offer an open invitation to come to uh, Merced County and uh, look at what we have there whether it's the heavy maintenance facility at Castle possibility or uh, the route and the proposed route and, and the uh, where it could go and how it impacts some of the uh, Areas so we can all be on the same page. So that's really what I came here for, just to uh, again thank you and welcome you, you at any time to come to Merced. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Um, next, uh, we'd like to hear from Mr. Robert Allen. I've handed out a sheet. On one side is Peninsula Rail Elements, on the other side is Allen's Bay Rail Plan. I would surely like to urge you to provide for a five-track grade-separated and secure trainway between uh, San Bruno, Melbury area, and San Jose. The two tracks on the west side of that trackway would be commute operation. Then the two, tra two tracks would be high-speed rail, bullet train, and one for conventional freight with regular clearances available, no overhead wires. Uh, some of the reasons for that, and I'd also like to urge you to consider uh, making the Caltrain uh, commute electrification be third rail with a five foot six inch track gauge, namely to allow BART around the bay. Uh, the reasons are uh, that uh, the BART trackway, BART, BART normally runs uh, four trains per hour, about every 15 minutes, that they have automatic fare collection, that we have one operator per train on BART. It's uh, easy boarding uh, for wheelchairs, for bicycles, quick boarding, quick offloading. It's comfortable. There are up to 520 wide padded seats on every train. It's the tunnel and the box in San Francisco would be cheaper because you wouldn't have to have all the commute trains going in. The trains into downtown San Francisco would be on the BART tracks. It would be the key to BART around the bay. Uh, there would be four downtown San Francisco stations for commuters instead of just one. Save a lot of... Uh, uh, provide for a greater diversity of in the downtown Sa San Francisco. Incidentally, when BART bonds were passed in 1962, until that time there were only two high-rise buildings, which would be over 10 stories high, roughly, in San Francisco. Everything else has come since the BART bonds were passed. There would be a shorter and less costly tunnel in San Jose, and I'd suggest using San Fernando instead of Santa Clara Street for the subway, going with a stop right by the college of San Jose State University. It'd be an alternate Transbay route if there anything happened in the Transbay tube. Uh, it would uh, be provide vastly simpler travel arrangements for travelers. You wouldn't have to figure from changing from Caltrain to BART or BART to Caltrain. And on those two tracks on the west side, the overhead clearance would only be 13 and a half feet instead of the uh, clearance for overhead wires. Uh, 
north from San Bruno would be about the, uh, perhaps the same with Muni instead of Wood Park, and uh, that we have a five-county rail district, the Bay Area. That should be something which would benefit everybody. I put the elements for a general bail plan on the back. And I thank you. I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Anyone else wish to address the authority under public comment? Seeing no one, um, uh, I, I would like to maybe um, tell you how I, I would, I'd like to run the balance of the meeting. We have uh, a few items of significance on our agenda, even though item two and three, um, I'd like to, uh, we, we no longer have a purpose to bring them forward. The ideas and proposals I wanted to share on item two were not distributed because they were not prepared yet. So I'd like to continue that item with the uh, board's acceptance. Uh, address then the balance of the items on our agenda. Go immediately into the uh, public workshop, uh, fr uh, the presentation from KPMG on organizational structure uh, before we get to our closed session. Um, th so I think it would uh, ensure that we're able to be expeditious in today's agenda. And if there's no object objection to that, then we'll move forward to item four. Appro approval of memorandum of understanding with Caltrain, Mr. Morshid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you uh, know, we have been working with uh, Caltrain for uh, over the years uh, relative to the uh, alignment or the section between San Jose and San Francisco uh, because all along the plan has been for the High Speed Rail Authority and the Caltrain to share the uh, right of way and possibly the track and signals and some other uh, mm -hmm. uh, equipment. And in that uh, area, we've had already two uh, memorandum of understanding with them relative to the cooperation and uh, uh, how we proceeded. At this time, uh, we have been, uh, for the number of months now, we have put together an organization between our staff as well as the uh, uh, joint powers authorities uh, staff and contractors because we are the alignment that we're working on between uh, San Jose and San Francisco is going to be uh, re receiving environmental clearance for both Caltrain and high speed rail therefore we need to share both engineering and planning environmental work uh, with uh, with Caltrain uh, in to accomplish this, we have put together an organization and an arrangement for the work to proceed and a method of cost, cost sharing where the two agencies will share in the uh, expenses associated with the, the, with the joint effort. Uh, with that, for, in order to expedite that, in order to be able to facilitate the uh, payment to the Joint Powers Authority and proceed with the work, uh, we would like you to uh, review and approve the, uh, uh, this memorandum of understanding that we can execute that and then uh, uh, formally uh, proceed with the, the work is continuing. We just need to have a method of uh, finalizing it and making the payment. Mr. Chairman, Very I, good. Mr. Gerla. I move the staff recommendation and we want to keep Bob Doty off of welfare. Two questions. Very good. Mr. Kopp. Uh, on page three of the attachment, uh, last paragraph, uh, PCJPB will provide engineering standards. I want to confirm that means that the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Authority will be primarily responsible for those engineering standards for both its trains and our trains. Uh, I'll let Bob uh, Doty to be more specific, but my understanding is that their responsibility is to provide the engineering and information they need for the Caltrain and their train operation, and we will be providing for the high-speed train, and the well, two need that, to work then together. This, then that sentence ought to be amended to say so. I would read it uh, as I just you just said that it, it seems to me that sentence means uh, the Peninsula Corridor JPA is uh, primarily responsible. And that's not the intent, I think. 
the intent is for those standards that are already established in Caltrain to be yeah. integrated with the high-speed rail requirements well, provided by high-speed rail for the design. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Spanos, I suggest that be clarified. What, uh, what page? Page three. The attachment. Attachment A. It says the will be provided engineering standards developed by and for the Peninsula Corridor. That is intended to be Caltrain. Well, but why not either uh, add a sentence uh, reflecting what Mr. Doty just uh, stated so that there's no ambiguity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before the meeting began, Mr. Humberg had a point about possible ambiguity as to decision making, which you may want to ask him to comment on. But it's of the same genre. Okay. So <coughs> well, can, uh, well, thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I want to make sure we uh, ensure that people are aware that Mr. Umberg is participating at yeah. the, this meeting. Good morning, Mr. Umberg. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair. <laughs> now, uh, details. I, I'm here, and, and you, you can let George Spanos know that it was properly posted, and uh, apparently the other Californians are late in arriving because I'm the only public member here. <laughs> well, you're not a member of the public. You're a member of the authority, and you're saying there's not a uh, tent full of members of the public? Not, not yet, at least. Okay. Very good. So on, on the question before us, Mr. Spanos, do you uh, believe that you could craft a modification of that sentence or a new one that would ensure that that ambiguity is addressed? Uh, Mr. Doty, who is an engineer, as you know, has in fact uh, suggested simply inserting the word Caltrain possessive S so that uh, the end of the first line reads, PCJPB will provide Caltrain's engineering standards. Chairman, that's acceptable to the maker of the motion. Does that address your concern, Mr. Cop? All right. The other question mm -hmm. I have. Well, I, I have yet, yet yeah. to accept the motion. I just want to make sure we get all the issues out, and then I'll certainly bring forward. And add them. The other question I have is on page two, last paragraph, last part of that sentence, PRP will deliver a fully electrified railroad, not only improve Caltrain service, but will support high-speed interoperability and service to the future, future Transbay Transit Center. Uh, as I understand it, the project manager is analyzing four alternatives, one of which is I guess commonly identified as Transbay Terminal Center. So I suppose, Ms. Sproul, maybe you want to bestow some attention on this. Uh, should there be some modifying language to clarify that that is not violative of the methodical sequel process? I see Ms. Sproul yes. nod her head affirmatively. Mr. Spanos, you have a suggestion on um, that sentence? Yes, I think we could simply delete the last part of that sentence so that it, the period comes at the end of the word service. Okay. Very good. Any other suggestions, Mr. Cott? No. Uh, Mr. Chairman. On? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Excuse Mr. me. Uh, uh, Commissioner Cott did ask me to relay a suggestion he had on the resolution itself. I just want to let the chairman yeah. know that before you actually take a vote because he wants to, uh, uh, there's a proposed amendment to the resolution. So when you're ready, I'll, I'll bring that up. Uh, are, all right, are there any other comments on the agreement or this item by members of the board? Yes, Mr. Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's not on the agreement itself, it's on um, whether or not it's ripe. And the question I have is, given all the obstructions that are taking place on the peninsula route, you know, with uh, litigation and all the rest, 
Is work under this <clears throat> memorandum of understanding happening now? Uh, yes. And what uh, would happen, uh, you know, in the, the, in the, the short term after we approve the it? The work and there this uh, in this corridor, the work is uh, the work being defined as what is needed to analyze all the options and complete the environmental uh, uh, project level environmental work in that corridor uh, started months ago and is proceeding at full speed. We are moving as quickly as we can to get that project ready. And most of the work that is being done here and will be done are going to be essential to addressing the issues that are being raised by the communities in that area. Uh, people want to know whether we're going to be elevated or under, you know, uh, on, on the ground. Uh, and so that requires analysis. They want to know how the system is going to operate. And the, actually, the, this memorandum of understanding is uh, to um, provide a, an official way of paying for the work that's already occurring in that area. Very good. Any other discussion on this item? Mr. Uh, Deardon, uh, you wish to make a motion? Motion stands as presented. Um, Mr. Deardon moves. Uh, no, and, and Mr. Katz seconds re re the motion with the mo two modifications. All right. The mo can I read the modification? It's very simple. Yes. yes There's can. a modification that uh, Judge Kopp asked me to relay to the board. Well, well, well uh, uh, um, I, I get that, but is that something, I mean, it's not before us, so the motion that's before us is on the resolution that is presented in our packet. So if there is any qu question other than that resolution, the motion is this resolution before us on the memorandum with the two amendments that were suggested by our legal counsel to address Mr. Kopp's earlier concerns. That's Mr. what the motion is, I believe. Mr. Chairman, yes, Mr. may Kopp. I ask through the chair, Mr. Spanos, just to read the language I suggested for uh, that first page? <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, what uh, Commissioner Kopp is referring to is the resolution itself in the last, next to last line. He would like, uh, after the words, as he or she's fit, as he or she sees fit, to strike the balance of that sentence and replace it with the following words, which are of a non-material nature, period. Uh, All right, it, I'll it, move that as an amendment. So, Mr. Deardot, this is your motion, so I want to make sure that uh, you're aware of what resolved further that the executive director is authorized to make such revisions to the draft amendment to the memorandum prior to signing it as he or C sees fit. Um, Which are of a non-material nature. It, it doesn't change my judgment. It does not change the... Uh, it, it, it's just a common that, that, uh, that's, way of That's comfortable with me. I, I trust Mady, and if, uh, if he does something wrong, we'll have his scalp later on. That he or, sees, see, uh, he or she sees fit let me let me write it down. I want to know what I'm voting on. Which? Can I approach the chair? Well, that'd be nice. <laughs> oh, sees fit, which are of a non-material nature. Okay, that's gone. Is there any objection to modifying the motion by the motion of the seconder? That's the motion that's before us. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Mr. Chairman, someday Quentin's going to give us yes, a legal Mr. bill and we're not going to be able to afford it. Next item before us is item number five, Mr. Borshed. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, as we are moving toward the construction of the high-speed rail, one of the many, many issues are the ones that we have to deal with, uh, such as financing, operation, systems, uh, construction, and so forth. And uh, the authority has always had a desire to engage the private sector to the maximum extent possible in uh, developing its policies and implementing the project. Uh, to that end, uh, last year the authority authorized uh, a, a, a process for uh, an RFEI to uh, find expression of interest from a private sector as to what kind of a uh, work or pro things well, they were interested in participating in. For the project, we received uh, about uh, 30 responses. 
and uh, the, uh, our financial consultants have been in contact with them in trying to make some modification. Since then, a number of things have occurred. Obviously, the bond has passed. Uh, the, the, the federal funding has been made available. There is an accelerated activity moving forward, and we are rapidly moving toward construction. So what we are suggesting is that uh, we uh, proceed with another round of uh, request for uh, expression of interests uh, to find out what the industry's uh, appetite and availabilities and the preferences are in participating in the project. And part of particular things that we would like to find out and eventually we will come, uh, we would like to uh, follow this with a uh, request for uh, uh, qualification is the areas of uh, construction, whether the size of construction find, uh, uh, people will be interested in and be able to participate in, uh, what kind of financing is there going to be in it, uh, who is going to be the operator and would the operator be part of the uh, equipment provider or system provider, would they be separate. Uh, there, there are many, many of these issues that needs to be addressed and we would like to be informed by the uh, uh, you know, uh, industry at large to find out what are some of the options and possibilities to proceed. Uh, at the end of that process, uh, the objective is that uh, sometime next year, hopefully by middle of next year, that we will have a uh, gone through a process, which this is the beginning of it, but the, the, the process will result in having a number of entities uh, pre-qualified to bid on the project as we move forward, and that qualified group would form a, uh, for the lack of a better word, as an industry uh, um, group uh, outreach where we would uh, test uh, periodically let them know what we are designing and what we are doing and have their comments on uh, validity of our work, whether or not that would change their uh, 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 ability to uh, compete or not, and have our engineering standards be uh, informed by the view of the industry and people who would be either financing, building, or operating the system. Uh, so this is this is the first step in that. Uh, we would like to start right away with the uh, RFEI and then uh, followed with the uh, uh, RFQs and eventually uh, those, those kind of pre-qualification. Well, thank you. I, I know there's a number of uh, members that wish to speak on this, and I think it's, it's appropriate. Um, I, I am slightly... Um, questioning what our full intent is here. Um, I, I, I think I understand getting a variety of private sector interest expressed. I don't think we're asking, though, we're not being precise enough to fully exhaust what the question is, and that is, um, uh, be it operation, construction, finance, those are all good questions to ask, and I think that's what you're trying to get, that universe of answers. But in fact, I, I, I am concerned that we are not precise enough to really start getting folks to the level of responsibility that they have to share precisely what they're willing to do. There will be a lot of people that will express interest, and we may get excited about that, but I think by showing a timeline by which decisions need to be made, timelines that show what type of private sector participation would be seeking, and then specifically, maybe that is what you do during the RFQ process, but um, I certainly know in the Central Valley there's a number of people expressing interest today about you know, heavy uh, maintenance facilities, but they don't know how to participate in that question. Um, they don't know, is, is this the means by which people would express interest, landowners in the Central Valley or cities or communities, or do they wait until there's a precise RFQ uh, being sought? Um, I, I just want to make sure we build, this is not an RFEI, this is just basically authorizing 
um, the executive director to solicit that level of interest, but I, I don't. I want to make sure I understand what what we are asking. Um, if it's just this broad ask to say anyone who has any interest, like we did before, and trying to update that list, that's all well and good, and I and I and I can see that that has value, but I don't think we will get the level of specificity that we need to really being able to be able to discuss um, is is there the value in going out and soliciting a heavy um, maintenance facility uh, property owners to submit their ideas for that I mean at what stage will some of that specificity be provided so people know when they really do need to participate and is this a requirement for people to participate under the RFEI uh, before they can participate under an RFQ process? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you asked a lot of questions, so I'll try to start from the last and go back and just try to answer as many as I can remember. Or at least until I forget, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, as, as far as the uh, last question, what was the last question? Now I forgot already. <laughs> now, in terms of the, yeah, the uh, we will be providing the, uh, through this RFPI, we will be providing them with the information about the project, where we are and what we intend to do. We will also you know, ask some specific questions and the kind, and, and in terms of what we end up at the end, what you're looking at an RFQ and what people want to participate, it's going to be more toward the RFQ because at this stage what we want to be able to do and be informed about is what is the appetite in the private sector for the size of the project? For example, if we have a uh, $5 billion construction contract with a, uh, some kind of vendor financing and so forth, are there more than one or two firms that can bid on it, who will be interested in bidding on it? And if they are not, then we just don't want to be able to pare it down to a smaller size. And, uh, and under this process, you think you can discern an answer to that question. Our, you know, financial advisors and others have informed me that, that it is. And what well, well, I guess that's what I'd like to yeah. see is at some point in time, we should be able to see what we're requesting. This is not. This is authorizing the executive director to come up uh, to work with our financial advisor to come up with something. And I, I just want to know what questions we are asking. Because if we are going out into this process, I want to ask as many questions as necessary to get the answers that we all are going to need in the next year, not just, um, I don't know if we are going to let a $5 billion contract in the next couple of years. Um, even the largest project within our era authorization package isn't $5 billion. So you are saying, though, what are those for construction purposes, one of those pieces. I'm, I'm saying there are a lot of other decisions, though, that we should be seeking private participation on, and does this RFEI capture all of them? Well, the answer uh, to that question is we hope that it does, and we certainly would like to get your thoughts in terms of what should, what kind of question would and should go into the RFEI. Uh, that the we are trying to use this mechanism to get as much intelligence as we can of what the private's interest is. Now, okay, granted, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a difficult one to get. The industry wants to have more detail. Well, but the industry is not the industry, and I guess that's what I'm having a hard time with. There is a construction industry and a finance industry, operations, systems, all of that. Some of them overlap. Not all the companies do, but there's also entities throughout the state that are seeking avenues to participate and I just I want to make sure we just don't look at this as the construction industry and how will they be able to participate I want to look at all of those various industries um, I know I think every member of the board has a question so I'll start to my right Mr. Katz thank you Mr. Chairman love being on your right um, <laughs> <laughs> for, for all of us, for him too. But, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to, in, along the lines you were asking the questions, um, you know, when I was looking at the at, at the discussion memo from the from Maddie, you know, you know, clearly the you know P three projects, the private sector part of it is going to be critical. 
I just was curious in terms of, because I noticed, you know, at one point you talked about, you know, looking at this as a mega project. I think we also should be asking it as a segmented project as well. I mean, we want to get, I don't think we want, I was worried that it was a little constrained, going to Kurt's point, I think, that, you know, because we, we referenced, you know, what's a reasonable time frame to respond to an RFP on a mega P3 project, but we also want to view this just as you're doing right now with all the phases right now as, as, a, as a mega project that's made up of a lot of small projects. And are there areas where the private sector will step up on part of it? So, so you know, I think that's important to have in there so that people don't say, well, unless I can do the whole mega, I can't, I can't participate as a private sector. Yeah, I, Ms. Cass, I think that's precisely what we're trying to. First of all, it is a mega project, but it's, abs you know, for certain, almost for certain, that it's going to be broken up into small, smaller pieces. Right. And the fundamental question we need to deal with is, how small of a piece do we have to make it in order to make it competitive? Can it be broken down into half a billion dollar, a billion dollar piece, three billion dollar piece in order to be able to get sufficient contracts in there? But it also Im implies, as uh, the chairman pointed out, is, for example, the question of the systems. You know, the, the core system is a very, very large expenditure. It involves the, the signals, involves the equipment, involves electrification, involves the uh, uh, train control system. It's a multi-billion dollar. So the question is, would the industry be willing to bid on a core system that may be a multi-billion dollar contract? I think that, you know, as we, as this evolves, I think we, want, I think we need to ask the question both ways to yes. make it answers on both of it, because part of my concern also is in, in the, in the construction industry historically, uh, you know, there's always been a tendency that when things are done on a larger scale, uh, fewer and fewer women minority owned disadvantages businesses also participate. And aside from the fact there's federal money in this, uh, given the, you know, the complexity of California's economy, and the amount of money here, we need to make sure that we're maximizing all the opportunities under this contract. So, uh, you know, that's also, that's also another reason I was asking about the smaller pieces because a lot of the maybe Weeby firms can't bid on the bigger pieces. Correct. And so when stuff gets bundled or put together, it excludes a lot of opportunity that I think everyone on this commission wants to make sure that we have as many people participating as we can. And the second piece on that, just when we talk about the workshop of the audience, you refer here to people who have previously expressed an interest. I'm not sure how old that list is or when that interest was expressed. I would guess that fewer people expressed an interest before we had all this money than are now interested, probably. Yes. Just like all the new friends we're finding that we have. Um, I, I, you know, we ought to cast as broad a net as we possibly can and make sure that when we send out this notice that it, you know, that it, besides posting it on our website and our normal mailing list, maybe through the industry, maybe through some industry groups, Caltrans groups that they reach out to on things like this, whoever it may be, I want to make sure that everyone in the state who thinks they have value to bring to this has an opportunity to take a look and say whether or not they want to participate. And I think that's what everyone up here, including the staff, wants to do. And that's, uh, that's precisely what we will and, and must do because, and it is international. It's not just, okay. just, it's not just, the, uh, just the U.S. and just California. So on Mr. This Katz, really is international. It needs to get as wide of spread as we can. And, uh, and we have a lot of people who are interested from different countries who are, who are watching what we are doing, looking at our website. So I'm pretty sure that it will get a very wide distribution. So in response to Mr. Katz's point, it's, it's yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Very good. Any other points, Mr. Katz? <coughs> no, listen, my, just on, the, on that's something that you and I talked about, Mr. Chairman. I mean, my hope is obviously that as much of this work is going to be done in California as possible. If anybody wants any, um, any advice on dealing with uh, an Italian rail firm, we have more than, more, than, more than enough to share from the MTA. So, Is that an ethics clear? <laughs> very, no, no, very, we just gave very a huge contract. So. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Ms. Schenck. Yeah, well, uh, Mr. Katz may be to my right, but he certainly covered... Um, several of my questions, uh, the first being the, the sizes that we're talking about, and so that's been answered. And just to re-emphasize, uh, I guess it jumped out at all of us that the, the, there would be special notice to those who expressed interest in the past. We now know others, since that list was put together, uh, who we would want to express interest, and I hope we will reach out to them, and I think I heard well, you absolutely. say that. And then finally, maybe a, a, a new the matter uh, to bring to the table is um, the issue of waste 
fraud, abuse, et cetera, bureaucracy. Uh, maybe you come from Caltrans. Caltrans was one of my departments a long time ago. We know that in big projects there is always an opportunity for a create creativity, shall we say. And I, I want to make sure that we learn from all that experience that, that we have had to build into this uh, a, a structure that doesn't bog things down but keeps very current and on top of contracts that are being let, subcontracts, sub-subcontracts, so that we don't learn about it after the fact that hundreds of millions of dollars have been um, somehow found its way where it shouldn't. So I just Thank you. want to make sure we Very good. Are Mr. Cop. Oh, Mr. Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I don't get it. And so maybe I need someone to explain it to me. Because it seems more like order taking rather than order giving. And where I come from, in, and I haven't been in business now for six years, but when we went out to finance things, we did our own intelligence gathering. We didn't go out and ask people questions. We do intelligence gathering. You should know who's potentially available for your project. And it's quite clear in this case who's potentially available. And then you, you craft what you want, and you go out to the market and you say to them, this is what we want. If you reach and do it, you will get the contract. This seems much more like, and I've talked to Sasha about this before, too much like order taking, where you go out to people and you say, are you interested in doing this or that? And where we're the ones who are in charge of doing sort of the categorization of whether it's a construction contract or this sort of thing, rather than going out to people saying, this is what we want, you figure out a way to get it to us, uh, this is the amount of money we have, this is the amount of money you're going to have to come up with, uh, these are the terms and conditions of the contract to meet all of Lynn's concerns. So I, I worry that we're not just being aggressive enough, proactive enough. It's much more sitting back saying, tell us what you can do for us. And in my experience in business, especially in, uh, th th I mean, this is not so much in, in my experience in business in California, because it was hard to do this kind of stuff in California, there's already enough concern that California can't get this done. So people are unwilling to reach uh, unless you tell them, if you do this, this will be your deal. So I, I'd love to understand better what they have in mind. I'd love an ex actual example of how they would go about and do this so I can see maybe I'm missing something. Ms. Flores, do you have any uh, additional comments? You know, I do. I just want to say, um, you know, starting with Mr. Katz and his comments here, he pretty much covered, you know, my what my comments would have been, but I just want to say that I'm grateful to the board for realizing that um, there's a lot of um, business owners out there that do want to participate, but I think we have a duty to tell them what we're looking for. Um, Mr. Crane here, you know, you have a, a different view, a slightly different, but um, I don't think it's order taking. I think it's letting everyone know what the project is, what's entailed, how many people do we have interested, and let them come forth, but I think it's, I think it's our duty to make sure that all of the information is out there, so we know if there are, if there's anyone out there to participate. Um, but I agree with um, the comments that Lynn has made and Richard, and I, I'm just grateful that we're, you know, the process is open to everyone. Appreciate Mr. it, Mr. Deardon. We, uh, you haven't pushed your light at the time, but do you have any additional comments on this, uh, Mr. Chairman? I, I'm, I'm uh, concerned about. David's comment, because I feel some of the same issue. Uh, I guess, uh, I guess, what I would be afraid of is that if we are not careful, and we ultimately put out bid specifications that disqualified a section of the bidding population because it was too, the, the chunks were too big, or it disqualified the California contractors, minority contractors, women-owned contractors, the smaller contractors, because because the, the chunks of, uh, of bidding opportunity were too big, uh, then, uh, then we would not be husbanding or parenting, pardon me, the, uh, the funding that we're given from the state of California effectively, because we want that money to stay in California if we can. If we have just great big contracts, 
if we have if we have just yeah. just big contracts to bid on, then it's probable that an international firm will come in and bid on it, and a lot of that money will not stay here. So I think what Mady's trying to do is to is to divide that baby or walk the tightrope if you have it that way, in order to be able to have the smallest contracts, uh, the smallest to identify. Uh, what the break-even point is between the size of the contract and access to the largest number of bidders. And I don't know how you can do that by actually putting it out to bid. By that time, it's too late. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm uh, probably closer to where David is. I just don't quite understand what we're looking for. Under what Mr. Deardon's comments are, we're, we're looking to find out um, who's ready to take our money and build a project I guess I'm trying to find out who is out there that would invest in our project and help us uh, build it. So I don't necessarily, I think during an RFQ and an RFP process on um, issuing a contract, um, we probably need to have a mechanism by which those RFQs and RFPs come before this board fully prepared to be executed for this board to be able to review them and then publicly allow people to come and say, by letting this language go in this RFP, you're excluding all of these firms. And then this board is able to catch that before it's issued. As opposed to starting today and saying, we really don't know what we're going to build first. We don't know where it is. We don't know if it's just the construction or operation or management or finance or land use or any of those issues. We just want all your ideas. I, I, um, I, I don't... I guess I'm having a hard time figuring out why, what we get out of this unless we ask a specific enough question. And you, the staff may have those specific questions, and I, they're not listed here, so I might not be able to he see what those questions are. But if I can't see them, I don't know why we would be approving this now just to say you draft something and put something together. Um, I do think there needs – I would like to have – um, to entrust the staff to do this is fine with me, but I would like to have a few more voices from the board be able to look at it <laughs> before it goes out to make sure we are asking all the right questions as opposed to just say, go ask a series of questions. We've done that before, a couple years ago, granted, before the project was real uh, because there wasn't funding to it. But we asked who, who all is interested, and we got a whole list. Uh, what are we asking now that's different and what do we expect that's different? What, what are the answers that we would expect that would be different? Kurt, Kurt I relate to you what you're saying. Yeah, and Mr. Deardon, yes. I, I think it's a, it's a good idea, but it would take a two-step process. We'd have to, in order to allow us to, uh, to adjust the, the RFP uh, in a manner that would, would correct any deficiencies, we'd have to have uh, submitting the RFP for public discussion us, dis us uh, commenting, uh, uh, receiving those public uh, comments, and then adjusting the RFP for final distribution. Is that what you had in mind? Well, I, I sit on a couple other boards, and that's what we do, that every RFP over a certain amount of value comes before the board for approval of that, most of which are on a consent calendar, but members have the ability to read the words and pull them forward if they wish and Be modify before, them. Before it's mailed out. Before it's mailed out, because then once it's mailed out, that's what we all agree is the terms by which the scope will work and what, what the evaluation criteria will be. And, um, you know, we, we all know that some of the g games played by other agencies may be to write an RFP such that it uh, does exclude some people. And, uh, you know, the, then those, I think a public process just allows... Uh, the public to be able to review that RFP and the wording of it before it's issued. I don't, I actually think that's all good, but I don't know how that applies now at this moment in time because we're not prepared to let a construction contract. And maybe it's the very early steps to figure that out, but I, um, yes, Ms. Shank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Co a couple things. One, I mean, I very, um, I, I like what you're saying and the direction you're going in. Uh, just uh, two things. One, I'd like to hear from Mehdi what would be the downside of delay. Uh, I, I, for one, can't see downside right now, but maybe there is. And I think that uh, Sasha, our advisor, would like to say something uh, about this. So when you're ready to hear. Well, good. There's a podium there. And if you're participating on that, then that would be a good place yeah. to stand. And I'll call on you at the right yeah. time. Mr. Cobb. But, uh, but yes. if, well, if Eddie has something to say yes. about the downside of good. it. I think, Mr. Chairman, uh, it would be the better part of wisdom to 
postpone this till next month, and uh, the director can memorialize for all of us the approach that is contemplated by the uh, recommended resolution, uh, including commentary on uh, David Crane's uh, comments. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that based on the comments of uh, members of the authority board that the uh, director can be better advised as to what the concerns are, what issues are uh, raised, and uh, then approach it. I can see, for example, the circumstances have changed since the spring of 2007 when the last RFEI was uh, responded to. And as uh, Lynn points out, uh, there were 28 on that list, and one dropped off, and another 13 apparently had been added. Uh, we did have at the beginning of the year a request for re-verification of all of those who remained out of the original 28 of their interest. Uh, that kind of dropped away. I, uh, it was halfway done, and we were informed, and then there was no consummation of it. So uh, I'd like to know what current circumstances are, but in a document I can see. Very good. Yes. Mr. Morshed, on those points and questions. Uh, again, there will be there were many, many points. First of all, uh, in answer to Ms. Shank's question about what is the downside of uh, postponing it? Um, I don't see a significant downside. We just we need to start somewhere. Whether we start this month or next month, uh, I'm not sure that there is going to be a, a, a major change one way or another. Uh, in in answer to uh, Mr. Crane's question, I, I think you know the the thing is that. He's right in terms of the, the, the normal circumstances would be to go out there and tell people what you want and then how they're going to pay you, how they're going to do it for you, and get the bids. In this case, we know we want to build a uh, 507 some miles uh, high speed train line between Anaheim and, and San Francisco, and we know all the characteristics and we know it's going to cost over $30 billion. And ideally, if there was a regular normal project, we put that project out for a bid, get a single contractor who come in and tell us how they're going to finance it, how they're going to build it, how they're going to operate it, and all of those, and it would be a single contract. That would be our, you know, normal, that would be a normal way of going after the contract. But in this case, we can't. Yeah, I, I guess I don't understand that being a normal Well, that's contract. if you have a project, you want to get somebody to come in and do the whole thing for you, and then you get one bid. Well, I don't, I've never, there's never been a project of this size where there's been one bid. So if, if you allow so, me, the next question is how do you break right. it down to the smaller pieces? Is that what we're asking in this? This is what we're trying to find out. It's what is the appetite of smaller pieces and what's the size? We can ask that question tomorrow. We can ask it six months from now. We can ask it next month, a, a year from now. Uh, in order for you to award the contract and in order for you to formulate your RFQs and RFPs, you need to have a better information of what the industry appetite is. And industry is a very, very broad sense. That includes financing. That includes equipment provider, that includes operator, that includes land developer, all of those. And the RFEI is trying to inform you of what the, inf the that industry is available. Uh, we'll be more than happy to wait. We're more than happy to get your and you know questions uh, uh, and included in RFEI. We will be more than happy to wait another one month or two months or three months to, to go after. Mr. Morshed, however this direction is going, I would like to see a list of questions we are asking every industry. I'd like to know specifically what information we want from con construction, systems, finance, land use, all of that. I, I want to know what we will be asking them. You know, when we originally talked about an RFEI, an RFEI wasn't originally talked about as a means by which we could find out the size of a contractor or the size of a contract that may be acceptable by the 
industry seeking that service. When we started the discussion about the RFEI, it was to solicit ways to get private participation within um, the, not only the finance, but vendor financing and other tools that we could finance the overall project high-speed rail. So that's what, where I'm having a hard time shifting my head from saying we want to have an expression of interest to see what people are willing to do and how they're willing to invest here um, to now shift to say we want to figure out what size of contract we should let. I, 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 w I want to know what questions we're asking in each of those areas and I would feel much more comfortable to say this is what we're seeking when we're, we're seeking their expression of interest to participate with us. I think we need to at least ask them something and ask people to say, you know, this is, you know, what size, the maximum size project, be it construction or financing or, you know, land development or station improvements or wh whatever. I, I'd like to be able to know what we will be asking them so that the intellect of this board can add to that list when we see it. And we will, for next board meeting, we will bring you the list of questions and, and forward to you earlier, Duff, so you can comment on it and then... Uh, We'll revisit the issue. Great, Mr. Crane. Figure this out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we ought to take a page out of Netflix, their book, and Google's book. Let's stipulate that this situation is sui generis for California. It, at least in, in, uh, in my knowledge, never before has the state said, we've got $9, we want somebody else to put up $31, and we want to build this thing. This is not like the old days, and this is the way the United States is going more and more because we don't have the capital to do everything ourselves. We also don't have the best ideas here at this board uh, to decide exactly what the question should be. We know the outcome we want. So what, what I would propose instead of us sitting here and crafting the questions we want to ask and breaking things down into categories, instead you use you know, the, the, the massive amount of human intelligence that's now out there like Netflix just did in capturing brains all around the world for their ideas of you know, how to better rate films or something like that, and say, this is where we want to get to. Here's what we've got. This is what we want to get to. Here's our timeline. You tell us what you can do to get us there. That's the sort of thing I like to do. But you know, I'm more than willing to look at this list of questions. If Sasha, who's brilliant, can come up with exactly the right questions that we should be asking, that's great. But I don't think that's going to get us there. We need the, the massive intelligence that's out there to come back and tell us what they can do for us. And you do, do you think from your past experience just asking that question in a public document gets um, an answer? Tell us how you it's will do It's pretty scary. I can't even figure out how to use our microphone system and I'm and trying to answer that kind of question. This is not a good sign. Um, um, in, uh, the short answer is yes, actually, that it's pretty remarkable what the private sector, especially when it's, it's a no-holds-barred competition and you make sure everybody knows that it's a level playing field and the best idea wins. If you go out and say, this is what we want from you, and if you provide this, you will get the deal, people reach. They really reach. So, you know, th that's why I don't like this idea of another risk, risk, you know, request for expressions of interest and answer a series of questions and a questionnaire and that sort of thing. It's, people don't think it's real if you just do stuff like that. And, you know, it's all about effort in life. It's all about will. So if somebody really wants to get something, they will reach to get it. So I do think if we can break down not so much the questions but the outcomes that we want. And we don't want to go into people and saying, we have to build a $40 billion system, how would you do it? We, have, we know that there are, we're trying to optimize it within certain constraints. It's going to be based in part on the application we're going to file tomorrow. So we already sort of know uh, the breakdown. We want to build Anaheim to LA. We want to build this to that. You know, whatever the, the application is going to suggest and things like that. In that world, and here's the limited amount of capital we have, and here's what we think we're going to get from the federal government, and this is what we want to get done by a certain date. And you can make a lot of money doing it. They, we don't need to tell them that. They'll figure it out themselves. You tell us how to get there. You, that, you, you, know, you risk nothing. The worst thing that happens is someone comes back with a bunch of bad ideas. But we have to ask a set. We, we have to ask those questions. Yeah, but the questions you're asking now are, you're not breaking down what you think is the way to get there, and therefore, what are you willing to do 
in the context of our idea of how to get there, but it's more like we want to build Anaheim to Los Angeles. Here's the money we're going to be able to have from the state. Here's the money we're going to have from the federal government. Here's our timeline. Here's what we need to do in that project. You tell us what you can do to get it done. That's, what I mean. that's, that's the sort of approach I would like to use. But also those questions would be operating a system. How quick can we have operational service in these areas? You know, what would you do to bring about the quickest possible operational service? Though, I mean, right? Yes. I mean, yes, but although you would like to say to them in that world, here's what we want. We want to operate it by a certain date. Right, but the question is we don't I, – I also don't want to just focus I, – I mean, I like this uh, approach. I don't want to just focus on building it. I want to focus on operating it. I want to focus totally. on some of the land use development opportunities that may be out there. And through this opening up this door, I'd like to be asking all of those level tiers of That's questions. That's a very good point because one of the one of the if you say again, if I'm just using the inverse of what you just said, this is what we want to get to, which includes operating the system, land use opportunities, you know, development around the stations. That allows people to come back into consortium. It allows people to pick and choose somebody they want to work with to say. Here's an idea, and it gets you everything you want, including a lot of the capital we need. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may. Uh, yes, Mr. What we, uh this, this is obviously uh, uh, very uh, interesting and, and helpful of a discussion. But let me also point out that the, the, uh, what we were trying to do in, in asking for your authorization for RFEI and then follow up with RFQ was – uh, precisely what you, the two of you are talking about, except in different stages. One was the RFEI was supposed to be the idea of putting out the net wide open with very general statement that this is what we want to do, this is what it is, what are your ideas and what are your suggestions, what are the kinds of things you want to do, and invite the industry and others to come in and with their creative ideas or what they may have that they want to participate. And using that information to formulate the RFQ, which will have very precise uh, criteria, very precise questions, and very precise way of evaluating the results and, and all of that in there. So the, it's, it's a two-stage process. And I think, and though, what I'm hearing from Mr. Crane is maybe what we do, though, is we then uh, segment the responses under that older, more traditional system and don't get that full collaborative process that someone may then look, seek out their own partners for a variety of steps. If we, it, under, a, uh, under an RFQ, are we pushing people into specifically to focus on, you know, a, a finance model or, or, or response, specifically focusing on engineering or uh, construction response and not having them focus on the bigger picture on how do you get this built with all of these elements considered yes, within the that. The RFEI is supposed to kind of give us that universe. And then what our intent was to use that information to formulate what kind of RFQs we're going to put out. We don't know what kind of RFQs we're going to put out until we find out what some of those potentials and opportunities are. And then when you find those, then you put your RFQs out. Initially, we need to know what the potential are, and this is not forcing in anybody into formulating any group at this time. It's simply getting some ideas of what people want to do, what they suggest we do, what has been done other places. So we can use that as a way of formulating our RFQs that will be more uh, precise. Yes. Mr. Crane. I did it. Um, I'm very proud of myself. I don't think we're saying the same thing, Mehdi. I, I really don't. I, I actually think um, um, you're, you're still circling back. You're, you're doing it. Uh, you're saying let's go out and do what, you, what you're suggesting, David, and then let's go out and offer these RFQs. And I actually think in that world people probably won't respond very favorably. I, I'm really saying, and this may not be possible in the government world, I'm really saying that we say these are the outcomes we want and then let people propose how they would get us to that outcome. And that, that means the outcomes that Kurt was talking about. So I really do think that one plus one adds up to more than two, the way I'm describing it. Whereas I think the way you want to do it is to go out and get the ideas and then break it down and go out with RFQs for each one of the components. 
that makes up what all these people have suggested. And I don't think people are going to really reach in that world. So, uh, and I can't point to, you know, something where this has been done before. I, I don't know, uh, you know, how they've done something like this. But like I said, I really think it's sui generis. If you look back at the things that uh, Robert Moses built, you know, in, in New York City, they didn't do anything like this. Nobody had to bring in all this different project capital. And, and, and so um, this, I think, it requires a, a longer conversation where we bat some of these ideas back and forth. Mr. Dearbond. Mr. Chairman, I, I have an idea. You don't want to take too much time, more time on this, but uh, I like David's approach. I like uh, uh, people bidding uh, to create a product, that, and we identified the specification for the product. Uh, the, the thing that I would fear, though, with that approach, without taking maybe step in advance, is that we would set up a proposal process that would, that would inadvertently screen out a lot of the smaller bidders. Uh, because they can't, they can't bootstrap up to to uh, be able to bid if the bid chunks are so large or the specifications are inadvertently uh, crafted in such a way that they don't have the capacity, even if they stretch, they don't have the capacity to bid. And uh, our California firms would probably fall into that category. Uh, if, we, if we don't craft it carefully, I think what will happen is what... Uh, Richard indicated he was concerned about it the very first uh, comment, and that is that uh, the international firms would pick up all the contracts and we would have a lot of our funding shipped overseas. That would be terrible, uh, given the unemployment situation in, in the nation. Mady's uh, step, first step, if, if his, <coughs> David, if his first step led to your second step, then we would know in advance if we're putting out uh, bid specifications that were crafted in such a way that it screened out California bidders. I also, though, think, uh, don't you, if, if the RFEI took an approach to an outcomes-based approach and we did, in fact, also encourage anyone who wishes through the request for expression of interest to say, I am interested in doing a piece, a small piece of this, and, and not require, when we're asking for the whole approach to be addressed, this is what we want to accomplish, give us your ideas. And if, if, our, if we ask then for the whole thing or any piece within that uh, request that you can provide, you are allowing small, segmented, regional firms to participate as well, and maybe even in a bigger way, if you say, we want to build the Central Valley piece and this is what we want to accomplish, give us your proposals and uh, express it. And in fact, um, we also say, or any, um, any subsection of this accomplishment you can submit at this time. You would have not only just California firms have an opportunity to participate, but a smaller regional firms that may just concentrate in the Central Valley or something. I mean, I, I think there is a way to blend both of these these pieces and opportunities. Mr. Katz has uh, motioned me a couple times. Um, I was just going to add, you know, I, I do like the approach that David's talking about because, I mean, having been through both the command and control era and the incentive era, uh, finding that incentives have worked better than command and control did. I mean, for those of us that, you know, Mehdi and I were in the legislature and Kurt was for a lot of that when we went through all that stuff in both on both sides of it. and. You know, it is interesting, and I don't know how you do it with a project of this size with the state rules, but we ought to find out because I do think there's value to saying to the world, hey, we got to get from point A to point B. And the things we're concerned about are uh, safety, speed, ticket price. Now, you tell me how, to, and then, you know, and, you know, and we have to go with, but, we, but the, what makes it harder, Dave, is sometimes, you know, you got local land use issues, you've got a whole bunch of stuff that has to go along with it. But... I mean, I do like setting a target like that and then seeing, and I think part of that is where Medi's trying to get um, through a more traditional path of how you get there, but I think setting the goal like that and then seeing what the world, because this will be a project that's going to attract mm -hmm. everybody in the world plus a whole lot of people in their garages who have an idea on how to do it, and we need to be able to sort through that, but I'd like to see the, the wider menu of options and, you know, encourage people to participate. There's not another project in the world like this is going to be. Ms. Schenck? Well, I just want to say I, uh, I'm also very comfortable with what uh, David is suggesting. I think that saying where you want to get 
and seeing the great ideas out there of how we get there is a, a very good approach. And certainly, uh, in addition to safety, speed, and ticket price, we can put in some of our other goals, which is California business participation, small business participation, and let the creative types out there, the big companies, uh, figure out how to bring these people in in an inclusive way. So we may find that there are some great ideas out there that are beyond this board. Yep. Well, I, I would like to suggest that, uh, Mr. Morshed, you, you work um, with Sasha to put together what that RFEI might look like, and specifically, I would like to suggest that Mr. Crane and Mr. Katz participate with you in formulating how that would be such that it would be presented back to this board at our next meeting. Mr. Crane. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all that sounds good to me. I, I want to point out something that I think what Rod said is exactly the opposite of what actually happens. A and I can use my own personal experience for this. And I now have enough experience with six years in government to confirm, I think, that my view is correct. Um, if you have government break down the categories instead of doing sort of an outcomes-based approach like we've just been describing, then it's the special interests that are very closely tied to government that get those questions asked the way they want them to get asked. The opposite is to do, this happened to me in business in 1980, when we were a little tiny fledgling firm and American Airlines went out and uh, for the first time instead of just retaining Goldman Sachs to finance their aircraft said, we're not going to do that. We want someone to provide us with the very best, the lowest cost capital in acquiring five MD-80s. My little firm wasn't even known. We had one office in San Francisco. We beat Goldman Sachs and everybody else because we came up with a better idea. If you say to people, I wouldn't even put this thing in there that Lynn just suggested about saying, and we want to make sure that California businesses get it. We, our responsibility here is to get this thing built and to get it built at the fastest pace and lowest cost. So let's let people come back and respond. You know, when you have all these ideas in here about saying, you know, like there'll be local land use issues, I guarantee you they're going to need somebody small and local to address those local land use issues, and they're going to need somebody small and local to do local developments, et cetera. But let the Netflix approach work. Let everybody compete and get all that brain power out there competing to do it, and don't put conditions on them. Let's see what they come back with. You can always add those conditions later. Well, if there's no objection, let's see what, uh, Mr. Morshed, you can come back with on this at our next meeting. And Mr. Crane and Mr. Katz, you commit to participate in uh, reviewing this so that by the time it gets here, you will feel happy with it um, and be able to advocate for a specific language. Thank, thank you, Mr. Katz. I just, I just, the, I just thought that in, in David's free market, all we had to do was make that statement here and everybody's going to come back and apply. I mean, <laughs> All right, if there's no other business on that item, we'll go to item six, which is uh, members' reports. I will just uh, briefly report that since our last uh, official monthly board meeting, I had the great pleasure to travel to France and um, I saw firsthand the uh, fine uh, TGV service as well as um, experience the operational service of SNCF and the French government and um, uh, it might be a tad embarrassing to say, but that was my first uh, high-speed rail uh, trip I have ever been on. Uh, the, we traveled from uh, Paris to uh, Strasbourg is one of the trips outside of my wife and I on our own went to Champagne for other personal reasons. But the, um, uh, so the government was not involved in that trip. But in fact, it, it really... Um, was a, a proper de demonstration to me of a lot of things, and I, and I think uh, through that experience, one mainly seeing how that system operates on traditional rail lines, moves on to a high-speed rail, picks up the speed, and then moves back, as it did about a, um, a half hour outside of Strasbourg, back on the traditional rails, and moves into the Strasbourg station at a slower speed, one that the the uh, traditional rails would support. Um, I really do think after we move through some of these next steps relating to uh, era funding and others, we really should talk about all of the various aspects of operations of our system um, because as Mr. Katz pointed out, 
we do are concerned about those three elements, but also how quickly we can have service moving in California, I think is one of the most important elements of that discussion. Um, I think uh, many are aware of the other uh, key items that have transpired over the last month. I think our staff has done a fantastic job in working to uh, put forward an ERA application for high-speed rail. Um, that application will be official as of tomorrow. The governor, um, we will be holding a press conference in conjunction with the governor in uh, uh, Los Angeles tomorrow morning uh, with that official submittal. And um, I, I th think the cooperative aspect between high-speed rail and Caltrans and certainly the governor's office will be demonstrated in a very strong application. So very excited about that. Any other members wish to offer any reports? Ms. Flores? You know, we uh, will also have a press event in Fresno tomorrow. And uh, we'll have... Uh, Congressman Costa on hand, as well as some other um, dignitaries. So it'll it'll be a good event, and a uh, lot of support in Central Valley for that. Yes, thank thank you. you, Mr. Crane. Anything, Ms. Shank, Mr. Deardon. Uh, four quick things. Uh, first, uh, we are very happy to be hosting the Northern California uh, rollout of the uh, governor's uh, presentation at the Deardon Station in San Jose at 10 o'clock, 10 at noon. We have a couple of Congress members, uh, uh, seven or eight uh, state legislators, and uh, we'll do our best to uh, show support that would be carried over to support in Washington. The second point is that uh, <coughs> uh, there will be a sequence of meetings uh, coming up this weekend in Orlando uh, as associated with the American Public Transit Association annual meeting. Uh, there will be a meeting of the uh, National Quarters Coalition and the National High Speed uh, and Intercity Rail Committee, uh, as well as uh, a panel that will focus on California among the other four uh, larger quarters. Uh, and uh, those will all be uh, associated with uh, California very uh, deeply. Uh, thank you to uh, Tony and his staff for uh, sharing the last update, which will be presented at the uh, at the panel uh, representing California's current status. Uh, in uh, February, on February 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, the UIC will uh, uh, conduct three different sessions in the United States, one in Washington, Chicago, and Los Angeles, uh, in successive uh, two-day blocks of time, uh, presenting the international technologies available for high-speed rail, all of them, not in modes, not uh, any contractor specific, but all of the contractors will be presenting their technologies and uh, we'll go into some detail with the technical people. So we'll be talking voltages and, and other kinds of uh, characteristics that we probably wouldn't be as interested in as what our technical people. But uh, that group is being brought to the United States by the American Public Transit Association and uh, uh, several other organizations, the Federal Railroad Administration, and uh, we want to make sure that we're involved in uh, certainly the Los Angeles portion of that, but it may be that we would want to attend some others. Uh, the Mineta Transportation Institute is a co-sponsor of that, uh, that session. Finally, may I offer a, a, a thought for study uh, for MEDI staff. Uh, we've been talking about uh, ways of increasing revenue generation uh, in the process. And other countries in the world Japan most prominently, but others also uh, use the air rights over the top of the stations and rail yards uh, for development. And that money goes directly back into the rail system because that land is owned by the rail system. I think it is time for us to begin thinking about that. Uh, if, we, if we let it go, uh, then the local station developers very well could put stations in a, in a condition or in a form that would not allow uh, the maximum generation of revenue potential uh, for the high speed rail, uh, California High Speed Rail Authority project. And so I wonder if we would not uh, encourage Mady to look at that, his, ha his staff to look at that potential up and down the tracks. Uh, certainly uh, in 
San Francisco, San Jose, there are large rail yards there owned by either uh, us or by our, our co-supporter, uh, uh, Caltrain, uh, that are large open space areas. In the past, they would not have been conducive to joint development uh, or TOD uh, because uh, the primary motive power was diesel. But as we shift over to electrically powered systems, the fumes and, uh, and vibrations that are associated with uh, internal combustion engines are no longer a factor. And it's, I think uh, some, some of you or uh, Mady was uh, with, uh, and Lynn uh, enjoyed the trip to Japan where we saw 50-story buildings on top of the rail stations and on top of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, marshalling yards. And if we're going to do that, uh, and we ought to, that's millions of dollars a year worth of revenue that we ought to be thinking about. Then uh, we need to do that before the stations are designed uh, by the local jurisdictions so that we can do co-design co work with those local jurisdictions. And I, don't, I don't think that's not going to affect your Arctic plans, uh, Kurt, but it could affect the plans on the tracks around your station. Uh, and uh, so it's a little bit of a delicate process to talk about that development in the middle of a city. You have to do, do development that's compatible with the city's objectives, but we certainly shouldn't leave those marshalling yards and, uh, and trackways associated with our stations as big, blank, open spaces as they have been in the past. Thank you. Mr. Katz? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. just wanted to report that the chair and I uh, visited with the LA Times two days ago. Was it two days ago? Seems like, or was it yesterday? Yeah, two days. I think it's two days ago. Um, to discuss the R application, and they had good questions. And you know, um, if if they don't do a good editorial, it's because they didn't like us. If they did do a great editorial, it's because we were brilliant. Um, but um, we're somewhere in between. But no, but that we had a good discussion with the Times and trying to get support and talk about the unity of the delegation, the unity of the, the commission, and trying to move the ball forward on this. Uh, there is a key meeting taking place in Los Angeles on Friday that the chairman's coming up to and all of us participate in along with our staffs at the MTA for the, um, the gateway cities in the South Bay that have had some issues as, as um, we're working to resolve those and, and make sure everyone's on the same page. And in that context, I'd also like, I don't think I introduced him before, but Alex Clifford, who's here uh, in the back, is the uh, new high-speed rail designee from the MTA. So. He's been working hard on the South Bay Quarter issue, on, on the on the on the um, on the Gateway Cities Cog, and some other issues. So, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rumberg. Uh, no press conferences. No meeting with the Kabul Times. Nothing else to report. All right. Very good. Uh, Executive Director's Report, Item Seven. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, once again, uh, it's time for the uh, submittal of the budget request for the following fiscal year, which was uh, a few weeks ago. And we did submit the request to the Department of Finance for our uh, next year's budget that, uh, are you ready for it? It's $975 million. Now, the, that's a big number, but the 750 of that is for potential right-of-way acquisition because we don't know what the uh, uh, you know stimulus money is going to be, and there may be some early uh, right-of-way acquisition that we have to do within the following fiscal year. So we wanted to make sure that we had the the authority to do that. <laughs> And that's included in the, in the budget request. Uh, we have the major items uh, in the budget is $37 million for program management, uh, about $150 million for preliminary engineering, and uh, uh, about $9 million for we put in for the uh, uh, early environmental mitigation. That's, again, similar to the right-of-way that we may have to do as we move toward construction. So that is the our budget request. I have copies of this, if you like. I'll be happy to um, distribute to you what has gone to Department of Finance now. Between now and January, we will have to uh, meet with the Department of Finance, and uh, final, you know, they will finalize the budget. In that, also, we are asking for additional uh, personnel of 35 
uh, for the, the next fiscal year. Uh, the, uh, as far as the stimulus funding is concerned, uh, we obviously, as you indicated, uh, you know, the staff and the contractor have been working very hard around the clock to get that going and practically for the last few months. It seemed like that's the only thing we did. We did a lot of other work, but it just seems like what was getting all the attention, mine and, and some of the key staff, was the stimulus. But I'm happy to see that finally is coming to a conclusion. A couple of points uh, on the stimulus. One is that the uh, I want to make sure we all, uh, everybody is aware of the fact that our application went to the governor, or our request, what the board adopted, went to the governor for the governor to decide whether or not he would like to include any or all of them in the California application, and if he would like to have established an order of priority. That is the governor's decision that he will be making in uh, his submittal. Uh, in, in the process of doing that, the governor's office requested that the uh, application for funding uh, between Anaheim and Los Angeles between High Speed Rail Authority and Caltrans be folded into a single application. Caltrans had requested uh, about $370 million for some uh, right of way around the, trans, uh, around the Union Station plus some additional costs on a great crossing. So at the request of the governor's office, our application has grown by $370 million, not the federal request, the total cost, half of that 370 as a request for the Los Angeles Anaheim. But at the same time, the Caltrans request has been reduced by the same amount. So the net amount is the same, but the governor's office felt that that would be more appropriately in our application. Uh, the, uh, at the, uh, concurrent, with the concurrence of the chairman, uh, we have asked uh, a number of, I mean, we've had a lot of requests, uh, let me start this, we had a lot of requests from uh, different industries, particularly different countries, who want to present their expertise and their information before the board, and in order to accommodate them, after, uh, I consulted with the chairman, and he agreed that the authority would provide an hour uh, during the November and December uh, presentation for each of the countries to make a presentation to the board uh, to about their uh, high-speed rail operation, what the potentials are and what they want, anything they want us to know about their, their system. So far, the French and the Spanish have uh, indicated that they would be doing that and we are waiting to, and uh, we will be contacting others as well Especially, we're focusing on the countries that we have already an MOU with. Uh, Mr. Cass pointed out to the LA cities meetings that I would be participating, and I want to uh, uh, personally thank the uh, LA MTA, Mr. Katz, and Alex uh, Clifford for helping organize that. There's a number of issues in the uh, within the uh, that corridor. And uh, this will be a very helpful effort trying to get those uh, issues resolved. Uh, I also, some of you already met her, I want to announce that, uh, that I find, I, once again, I have a new assistant. <laughs> and uh, hopefully this time will last longer than a couple of months. <laughs> and, uh, I, I don't know. There must be something wrong with me because I don't seem to be able Second. to. Second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, I don't, I don't want to admit it, but obviously there is. But uh, hopefully this will be the, but, but Sam Newman is going to be my new assistant. Where are you, Sam? There you are. And, uh, and finally, I just want to let you know that on, uh, I'm leaving on two weeks vacation. I'll be out of the country. And Carrie Porvady will be in charge, and uh, uh, I'll be back on the 19th. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Um, any other business on these items, Mr. Crane? What's going to be our procedure now for going over the proposed budget? How, when are we going to do it, drill down on it and go over it? When does that happen? Whenever you want to do it. Does that happen at a scheduled meeting or? Well, well, it is somewhat of a surprise to me. Um, 
And after today's uh, workshop, uh, I would like to formally kick off the committee structure. And within the purview of the Executive Administrative Committee, uh, that should, uh, certainly is one of the, the responsibilities under that uh, committee. Um, I, I believe, Mr. Crane, your question is appropriate to say that should be at least an informational item on our budget before we ask for a budget or, or on our agenda before we ask for the budget request. Um, one, to make sure every member knows, and two, to make sure every member who agrees helps to get the, that funding level necessary. Oh, and there's a third reason as well, which is I noticed some of the money, uh, not the right of way, potential right of way spending, but you know, there's a hundred and something million for program management, et cetera. I, I am, uh, you know, a broken record on this stuff. I want us to be looking at every vendor and saying, what are you doing to help us to get the rest of our capital? So I want to be going over every one of these contracts uh, that we have with people or we intend to have with people and making sure that we're getting everything out of them we can to help get the balance of our capital. But so I'm really interested in that subject. So on the budget itself, the budget request, would you uh, uh, please agendize that for our November meeting so we have those items. I know Ms. Shank brought that up uh, six months ago to ensure that we, we do have a presentation as to what – get that, Richard, would you? Um, a presentation um, on – what uh, what we're asking for, and to make sure we uh, have transparency in that uh, request. Okay. We'll do that. Okay. And, and a presentation from uh, staff on what the, that budget would, um, what those budget requests are for and to whom, so we understand that process. Any other business uh, to come before the authority? Because what I'd like to do is now um, quickly asked to start with our uh, workshop and have the workshop presented to us prior to the closed session. Is that okay, Mr. Uh, yes. Executive Director? Yes. So with that, who will be the uh, presenters? Be Barbara. Ms. Lloyd? Mr. Chairman, while they're setting up, let me just uh, point out that uh, we have had a, a number of issues in the past. I mean, we've, you know, struggled with the organization and especially go, uh, going from a, a, a small entity who is primarily planning and doing some environmental work into an entity that has to deliver a, a mega project. And uh, you board members and all have been uh, concerned about this and you express your concern to me and I'm, so am I. In order to try to get a handle on it, uh, we uh, retained the uh, KPMG uh, as a, um, a contractor with an experience in this area to look at the uh, work that we would, uh, the authority would need to perform over the next uh, few years and to come up with and, and compare this with this work some other places have been done and come up with some ideas as to how the authority ought to organize itself. So this is a, a report from KPMG consultants to you as to what their findings are. Very good. I, and I want to just make sure um, I with, thank you, Mehdi, for focusing on this. Part of our challenge in this transition is moving from a planning agency to an implementing agency, and you're going to sh share that. I know that's your line. Um, <laughs> but I think it's um, very appropriate that we all look at what the different needs are of an organization, and KPMG, uh, KPMG was charged with uh, really looking at our current organizational structure and providing a structure by which we can um, Im implement the, uh, uh, the project that's before us. So, Mr. O'Neill. Great. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is uh, Bob O'Neill. And I was the project director for KPMG for this organizational assessment of the authority. Uh, with me this morning are Barbara Lloyd and Daryl Suchihara, who were uh, our leaders on the project team. Uh, what we'd like to do this morning is just briefly uh, provide you some background on our study and talk about the scope of our services, summarize the methodology we used, and also just give you a, an understanding of the current organization structure uh, which exists at the authority. We also would like to tell you uh, the results of our interview process with various stakeholders and what they saw as far as the strengths, weaknesses, and challenges of the current uh, organization structure and the uh, mission you have, as well as some results of the benchmarking we performed 
with other large agencies throughout the world who are conducting mega projects. In addition, we'd like to talk about kind of where you are today as an organization and contrast with that to where you need to be probably somewhere five years down the road in terms of uh, the roles and responsibilities you'll be playing in the future and how your staff in your organization is going to have to stretch to uh, meet those responsibilities. And then finally, we have some suggestions at the end regarding uh, some next steps in terms of how to proceed. We'd like to invite you to ask questions along the way throughout the presentation, uh, and we'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Um, the authority has been operating with a very lean staff to get it off the ground and up and running. Uh, obviously, the authority is now in a, a growth mode, and it recognizes that the, the importance of ramping up to meet the challenges it's going to face. Uh, currently, the authority has a, a hybrid structure for an organization. It's relying upon its own small staff as a core group of people, it uses a quite a few private contractors to carry out various roles and responsibilities. It also re we relies upon a number of retired annuitants and then also some various state agencies to help it out in carrying out certain ministerial tax tasks like accounting and finance, things like that. So just a variety of, of people doing a variety of roles and responsibilities to carry out your duties. So the authority asked us to take a look at how that was working right now, uh, recognizing the growth going forward and what the challenges were in terms of the organization. To do this, we took a look at the uh, legal authority of the, uh, of the authority. <laughs> uh, we also, in talking with the stakeholders, we asked about the various expectations they had in terms of how the authority was going to conduct its business. We looked at the strategic plan. We looked at the various tactical and business plans. Uh, as, as well as talking with people about their vision of what the authority might be for California. And also we went through and talked with the existing organizational uh, people in the staff and the organization. And then we also did a comparison with other mega projects throughout the world, looking at what other organizations had done uh, in order to uh, ramp up to meet those needs. Uh, as uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman Pringle stole my line, uh, the authority is in a dramatic transition right now and is in the process of going from a planning organization uh, to a project implementation organization. Uh, we looked at what the potential needs and demands are going to be as you make this transition from just planning to actually get involved in the implementation of this uh, quite large undertaking. And there was three things that really uh, stood out to us. Uh, first of all, the, the fact that it's going in this transition from a planning to a project implementation organization. Secondly, the fact that this is really a mega project which you're undertaking uh, by world standards in terms of what you're doing. And it's going to require a, uh, a much more sophisticated uh, organization to manage, uh, direct, and control the various project activities you'll be undertaking. And thirdly, we're looking at that proper balance between Who's doing what? Uh, how much you're relying on private contractors in the past? And is that the most appropriate way to go forward in terms of managing the accountability and ensuring that the, uh, the public interest uh, is maintained by what you do? This next slide briefly shows some of the things we did in our assessment. We reviewed the basic documents that exist at the authority in terms of uh, what they're carrying out right now. We interviewed key players both stakeholders as well as people at the authority, benchmarked with comparable organizations, and we also drew upon our network of professionals who work with many of these projects throughout the globe to get an understanding of what they're seeing at these various organizations uh, in terms of the types of structure they're using to manage what they do. Oops. Okay. This page gives you a little sense of some of the organizations we drew upon. Uh, you can see that there's a variety of mega projects throughout the world that we, uh, we interviewed and talked with them regarding their organization and staffing and trying to look at the implications which might, uh, they might hold for uh, the California High Speed Rail Authority. If you go to the next page, this, talks of, this actually outlines the uh, different organizations uh, that we talked to. Uh, the left-hand side shows the various uh, international organizations that we dealt with, and on the right-hand side, various organizations in California uh, who we talked with to discuss uh, kind of 
how their approach to uh, managing these types of large projects might apply to uh, the California High Speed Rail Authority. This is a, a colorful uh, slide at best, or at worst, uh, but basically it shows the, uh, the authority's current organization structure. Uh, basically the authority has been operating with less than 11 full-time positions uh, augmented, as I mentioned, by various other folks, retired annuitants, some contract staff, uh, as well as uh, contractual services with other state agencies. Last year, the authority did put in a budget request for additional positions, and uh, it was not fully approved. And this kind of shows what's in place as well as what was asked for previously uh, for the organization. But you can see that the staffing of the organization has been uh, very, very lean over the past year. If you look at the, the, the light purple up at the, both, the top right and left-hand sides, those show the control agencies that um, have that oversight over the, uh, the board and the, uh, the authority. The blue is actually, or the teal I guess it is, is actually the positions which currently exist. Uh, and those are the spots that are, are right now funded positions. The, I guess, beige or buff colored <laughs> that you see on the left side and the right side, those are positions which uh, are either retired annuitants, contractors, uh, or contract services with other state agencies in terms of how they're being provided. And then the green, which is the last uh, on the right and is throughout the organization, shows additional positions that the authority uh, put in the budget request for last year. Uh, but were not funded. So it's, once again, it's a very lean organization uh, relying upon a variety of uh, people uh, and organizations to provide uh, services to them. If you, this, this chart just basically talks about the various major roles within the organization, which firms or contractors are providing those services, and then 